Okay. Um, so how many people here have used Monad Transformers before? All right. Um, anyways, hi, my name's Edward Komet. I do a bunch of stuff in the Haskell ecosystem. Um, uh, Michal uh, <laughs> invited me down here to give a talk. Um, and uh, I didn't really have anything planned, so I decided I was going to talk about the thing that's kind of been burning a hole in the back of my brain for uh, uh, maybe a year now. I just haven't had a chance to actually talk about it or really express it anywhere yet, so I figured this would be a good opportunity. Um, we're at Monadic Warsaw, so a talk on Monad Transformers and things related seemed appropriate. Um, so, um, let's see here, how to, how to get this. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is a notion of a lens that I've been playing with that has nothing to really do with the notion of lenses that I've already popularized in the Haskell ecosystem. Um, this has to do with um, if we take that concept and we start pushing on it to see where it generalizes, it generalizes in some surprising ways. Um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Uh, this happens to be one of those cases that has kind of a mixed ending. I don't really have a, a happy ending to this story yet. Um, so I'm warning you now. Um, there's going to be a lot of build up, but it may fizzle a bit at the end. Um, because I, I just don't have the full answer yet. Um, but I can at least try to motivate the problem here. We can set up some, some of the material. Uh, at any given point in time, if anybody has any questions or wants me to go deeper on something, feel free to ask. I'll happily drill. Um, but I'm going to need to set up a lot of introductory material here before we ever talk about monads, really. So I apologize for the long tangents that will be coming. All right. How many people here have looked at the notion of the constraint kind that we have in Haskell? today. Okay, so like three people, four people. Um, I'm going to really need to push on this. Um, and part of it is the notion of a monad transformer that we have today in Haskell isn't, doesn't say everything it really should. Um, so we have class monad trans uh, t where uh, you have lift that says if m is a monad, we can take m of a and give you t of m of a, right? But what we really need to know is that if m is a monad, then t of m is a monad. And that's not a fact that you can derive just from this operation. It's a missing thing. It's a thought we couldn't think when the monad trans class was defined back in the Stone Age. <laughs> um, so what I really want is some sort of, um, let's call it trans, and this should be able to say that if monad m, then monad t of m. So now I need to introduce this colon dash symbol. Um, so I wrote, I wrote a library a while back called Constraints, um, right at the time that um, Max Wallingbroke implemented the, um, uh, the constraint kind extension. So what happened there was this. Uh, what is the kind of eek int? Right? We, we write it like eek a um, uh, or uh, ord, ah, keyboard, new keyboard, ord a on the um, We write these kind of things all, all over the place. Is this a type? Well, types have kinds, right? So in order to actually sort of make sense of that, what Max did was he said that ord has kind in this case, star to constraint. It takes an argument of kind star, which is any normal type you know, fully applied that you're used to, and gives back a constraint. And the thing on the left-hand side of this equal greater, you know, the, the, the sort of double arrow, takes something of kind constraint. Okay? Now, with that little bit of machinery, I was able to build um, a data type we'll call dict, which takes some p, which will be a constraint. And we can say that dict says, you tell me p, I'll tell you dict of p. Okay. So before, we used to be able to build GADTs that would like capture an ORD instance or something like that. So if you wanted to know that you had an ordered dictionary for a or something like that, you could say, or dict 
or or a or dick to a. Right? Now using this, we can just talk about dick of or to a. We can write this once and for all. We don't have to make up a new one of these every time we come up with a new class constraint. Okay, so this let us generalize over this approach. And once we have this notion of a, of a dictionary, we can um, play some games here. We can say that P entails Q is a new type. So this is making the operator the new type. Where if you tell me P, I can build you a dictionary for Q. Okay? And with this, um, I can just turn on enough extensions to make GHC happy. Probably don't need all those. Type operators, right? Constraint is in GHC prim now. Here's uh, life I hate. Types. This is gonna get worse as it goes. Usually I do the one for one. Okay, so that compiled. Now we have this type, right? And if I want to know that ord of a would tell me that leak of list of list of list of a is true, like if I can derive and a dictionary for equality for list of lists of lists of A's given or of A. All I have to do is say, hey look, sub dict and let GHC um, derive it for me. Boom. Okay, so we ask GHC, hey, given this one constraint, can I prove this other thing? And the only me mechanism that it has to do that is that it can walk through instances. Because it knows that e instance of eek of a gives me instance of eek for list of a. And it knows that we have a class, or, which is a subclass of eek. So what it's able to do is use the class and go backwards across that arrow. The arrows kind of work different directions for classes and instances. You can say, OK, I have an ord for a. I can figure out eek for a. Then I can figure out eek for list of a. Then I can figure out eek for list of list of a. Then I can figure out eek for list of list of list of a. Okay? And so that's what GHC does behind the scenes. So now I'm able to work with this constraint kind as a, uh, well, this thing takes two arguments. And we have a class in Haskell. Category. We can make a category of constraints. So here, let's see how we can do this. Um, uh, instance category that thing, where the identity is well, you know, if you give me a, if you give me a constraint p, I can give you a constraint, I can give you a dictionary for p. That's just dict. But now I need to be able to compose them, and that one's a little bit tricky. So I don't know how to do this one directly, um, but I do know how to write a little substitution combinator. I don't remember if I can do this off the top of my head. This would be fun. Um, if P entails Q, and Q would give me R, and I know P, then R, right? So, um, let's see if I can do this. This is R, um, my subject is R. Let's see if I can change you the control category dot, where did I? Oh, it's a warning. Build it. Okay, so what did that do? So in order to satisfy this constraint here, we had to take this dictionary for P. In order to um, open this, I needed a P in scope. Right, because this says that P entails Q, but this means that I need P to get a dictionary for Q. So we take this dictionary for P, we plumb it into here as we open sub, this GHC pattern matches on sub. Then um, we, we pattern match on dict, which brings Q into scope. Once we bring Q into scope, this thing, this obligation is discharged, and now the R is successful. So just by writing that, GHC did all of that plumbing for us. OK? 
So now, I should be able to do something like this if I can remember how this works. P, Q is sub, dict, uh, P, Q. This might be this order, it might be the other order, I can't remember. Eh, worked. Okay. <laughs> so we said, go build me a dictionary, but then substitute in the environment using P and then substitute in the environment using Q. Okay, so this let me glue these together. So now, if I know that P entails Q and Q entails R, I can get P entails R. Okay, so this little category is a fun thing to play with. And I only needed it because I wanted to be able to talk about, if you remember before I started erasing things, monad M entails monad T of M should be part of monad trans. It's just a missing concept. And it was because we didn't have this vocabulary prior to like GHC 7.4. It was just a thought we couldn't think. So um, now that we're not really tied by Haskell 98, we can do a little bit better. Um, okay, so now we have constraint kinds. So from now on, I'm just gonna use the constraints library which has these exact definitions here. I've, I've got a bunch more, but I'm not gonna be using them. Okay, um, so now we have constraints. Um, and I'm going to put them on a shelf for a little while and we'll come back to them later. Um, now I need to talk about what a lens is. How many people here have been exposed to lenses in Haskell? Okay, so um, considerably more. Um, so one way to think about a lens is like a pair of a getter and a setter, right? This is the way that we've kind of taught ourselves to think about lenses. That I can break, I can say how do I get a, some part out of the hole and if, if I were to modify that hole, how do I put the part back in? Right, this is to get a functional equivalent of a getter, setter, pair, to sort of replace all the functionality that we lost when we gave up the imperative style of programming, right? We can't say foo.bar.bez plus equals 12, or we couldn't say that in Haskell before. And now we can do cooler things with it than the imperative folks. Um, I'm going to argue that this is not what a lens is. Um, this is a specific case of a lens, a rather degenerate case of a lens. Um, there's another formulation of lenses that, um, somewhat ironically, uh, Tuan Van Marhoven, the guy who came up with the current formula and coding of lenses that I use in the lens library, um, prefers, which is to think of a lens as splitting uh, the hole into the part that you're looking for and the something that's out of focus, like the rest of it, the complement. Okay. In the bidirectional transformation communities vocabulary, they refer to this as a constant complement, and they go off in a different direction. They try to say that there's all sorts of categories. You can't have constant complements in. But I'm really interested only in this very, the, the very well-behaved lenses that they're all bored by, um, because I can reason about their behavior really well. And so I'm only really interested in lenses where we have some kind of constant complement. So it says that I can, like, um, so if I say that I have a lens, from S to A, I'm just gonna make up some notation as I go. I'm really kind of thinking of this as S is isomorphic to the pair of some complement C and A. So there exists some C such that S is isomorphic to the pair of C and A. Okay, and then lenses are like families of things, so I really want S and I to be isomorphic to this, but then the complement isn't indexed. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> Like, there's ways to think about this in a more nuanced fashion, but um, what I am looking for here is this notion of splitting. And this splitting works in a much more general setting than just with products. How many people here have heard of prisms in the lens library? Okay. So a prism, uh, so a lens is a split, split into a getter center pair, right? Like, there's one way to think of it. Or it's splitting into two halves of a product. A prism is really about splitting into cases. It's, let's do either. Um, it's splitting into co-products. Okay? And one, uh, like, set of intuitions here is to start thinking about this as dualizing a lens, but it's not really the dual of a lens. Um, not in the right way to, once you start, if you, if you, like in a first order approximation, it's, it's the dual of the lens. But another way to think of this is that these are both instances of the same pattern with different choices of thing on the right hand side there. 
And so what is that thing? Okay? And so there's this um, uh, uh, boilerplate term that Wadler likes to trot out every once in a while. That monads are monoids in the category of endofunctors. How many people have heard this phrase before in the Haskell ecosystem? <laughs> How many people have used it to try and scare off a newbie? <laughs> um, this fact has an awful lot of information, th th this statement has an awful lot of information actually packed into it. It's not just a weapon to scare off newcomers to Haskell. Um, so what is this? Um, so in order to have a notion of a monoid, you need a category that, that the monoid lives in. It's a monoid object in some category, and that category has to have a certain amount of structure. Um, it has to be a monoidal category. Now, the category of Haskell data types is a monoidal category in two different ways. We can build, the, we can build Haskell as a, as a, uh, as a um, monoidal category with respect to products or with respect to coproducts. Okay? What, what monoidal here is, a monoidal category means, is that there's a number of operations that we can say that product offers us and coproducts also offer us. We can associate them. If we have the pair of AB paired with C, I can pair A with the pair of B and C. I can go back and forth between these two representations and no information is gained or lost. There's a unit. Um, if I put unit in a pair, modulo bottoms, because we just pretend those don't exist once we start talking about Haskell, um, um, and that's morally correct to do. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we can say that you know, the, the pair of A and unit is isomorphic to A, which is isomorphic to the pair of unit and Again, there's an extra bottom hiding, a couple extra bottoms hiding in there in the real world, but let's just pretend that didn't happen. So we have a unit, and we have some kind of associativity thing. It feels kind of like a monad, or like a monoid, but it's really sort of the place where the monoid hangs its hat. It's the, it's the shape, it says basically, like if you think about monoid as, as we are normally presented with it, we have mapend, right? And what's that do? It says, if you give me two M's, I'll give you one M. So it's saying, if you give me a pair of M's, I'll give you one M. And the other one says that if you give me nothing, I'll give, if you give me a unit, I'll give you M. Like, this is empty in disguise, like, <clears throat> So if we peel, if we, if we kind of mangle uh, Mempy into this form, instead of just the naked M, and we um, mangle Mepen into this form, now this is about products and the fact that unit acts as a unit for product. Okay, that's the sort of skeleton upon which we hang our, our notion of a monoid. Okay, and you can even come up with a notion of a monoid that would look really weird. We have void as our uninhabited data type, which acts as our unit for either, again, modular bottoms. Um, and you'd want these to hold with the usual monoid laws. Now void happens to be a monoid with respect to either in Haskell. And I'm skipping McLean's pentagonal coherence conditions, a couple triangular identities and stuff like that just because I really don't have time. <laughs> um, so if you're really interested in this, you can Google what a monoidal category is and we're, um, everything here is weak and lax and horrible. Okay, so we have Mapend and Memke here. Um, so what did I need for this to really be? Uh, so this had to be a bifunctor on the category of Haskell data types, so you can map over either side of the pair. You can map over either side of either, right? Both of these are bifunctors. They go from hask to hask to hask. Um, they, they both have that associative thing. They both have some notion of a unit. So let's move up to another category. If we move up to the category of functors on Haskell data types, now functors from the category of <laughs> functors are, uh, um, how to put this? What are the morphisms in the category of functors? Well, the morphisms there are natural transformations. So you could build a product there. Um, right? And you can then show that this is a monoidal category with respect to this product, that there's a unit for this, which is kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and you can have both boring and F is isomorphic to F, and you know, et cetera, right? Um, you can make, um, 
sums here. Right? And we can build all sorts of things, and then the unit here is even more boring. Um, but there's another um, monoidal structure that we can endow this category with, uh, another tensor that we can equip it with, which is that we can talk about compose. This is the definition that we have today. Right? And now if you were to give me, if, you, if F and G are both functors, and you give me a natural transformation from G to H, then you can map over the second argument of this and change it to compose FG and to compose FH. If you give me a natural transformation from F to F prime, you can get compose FG and to compose F prime G. This is a bi functor. It has a unit, identity, adds no information. Right? And then if we go back and we start playing with Memke, here, this is going to be uh, an arrow in the category of functors, and this one will be from compose M, M, A to M. And if we start undisguising this, this is M of M of A, and this is A to M of A, and this is join and return, right? So this is where monads are monoids in the category of endofunctors. They're monoid objects with respect to functor composition as our choice of tensor for this as a for Functors is a monoidal category. Okay, this is the beginning of the slope down the rabbit hole. Um, so I warn you now. Okay, so what's a lens here? Right? What is that saying? What would a lens be? Well, a lens in the um, let's call this a functor lens. Uh, there exists some complement C such that SI is isomorphic to, well, this is going to start to sound wrong, compose um, my complement with AI. Well, that's not quite right um, because each of these things had an extra property that we're missing here, which is that they're symmetric. That if I have a product of A and B that's isomorphic to the product of B and A, I can move back and I can swap the order around. With compose, compose FG is not isomorphic to compose GF. Okay? And that means that whether I have the complement on the left or on the right or on both sides actually matters. So now we can start talking about the notion of a left lens or a right lens or a like a bi lens, I guess you could say, a lens that requires both <coughs> the ability to put composition on either side. And all of these become distinct concepts in this setting. So what we really need is something like, there exists C and D, such that, let's just use S. And S here is, again, a functor. So we're saying that our functor is isomorphic to a stack of functors, where we pick out one functor in the middle. OK, so this is saying that, like, what is state, really? Well, state is isomorphic to the composition of the reader monad and, well, the, 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 the function from S and pair with S as functors. Um, so we could say that we could build a F lens to look at the reader part of state. So this starts to sound like a way to embed effects or something like that, but it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is that this only says that um, uh, I have a natural transformation. Like that this is a natural isomorphism, that S is naturally isomorphic to the composition of C and D and, and back. That doesn't say how return for one acts with respect to the other. It doesn't say how bind for one acts with respect to the other. So we said the state and reader, we can like zoom in on the reader portion of state. Now this accidentally happens to work, but it doesn't work for other monads. Okay, so now I have enough stuff to start talking about what I'm interested in doing. We have, we have this funny constraint kind stuff. We have this notion of monads or monads in the category of endofunctors giving rise to this concept of a monoidal category, and there's all sorts of generalizations of that, right? So 
The problem here is this. Um, when we teach people to use the MTL, the first thing we try to teach people to do is to not write to a concrete monad transformer stack. Don't write to state T S of reader E of IO. Right? Write your code to use a set of constraints. Say, instead of writing directly to state T S reader E IO and saying, you know, type M is this thing. Right, and then working with M everywhere. We try to teach people to instead uh, write their combinators to say, well, we're going to take a monad state for S um, and a monad reader for E, M, and a monad IO for M, and go. And that way, as you add more monad transformers or more stuff, you can still use this smaller computation in a larger monad transformer stack. Right, this is the pattern that um, we teach everyone to use with the MTL. And it's terrible. Um, it's terrible for performance. This is actually a large part of how the FX crowd has managed to gain a foothold on, uh, you know, on the story of how to deal with special effects, or, or effects and hassle, um, is because the MTL is so inefficient at this. Because what does this do um, to the code that's generated? Well, we don't know what M is. So all we can do is we can rummage around through these dictionaries for monad state or monad reader or monad IO and say, oh, how do I call lift IO? Oh, I have to go do that. Okay, how do I bind? Because I don't know what M is. Oh, I have to go look at a dictionary and do that. So it's this constant stream of sort of mother may I requests as you keep asking a dictionary that you know nothing about. Now, if you're lucky, this inlines, right? And then this isn't a problem. But the moment you write a recursive function, it can't. And we tend to like recursion, you know, to do more than one step of a thing. So the moment this thing becomes remotely interesting, the pattern that we teach everyone to use the MTL for kind of breaks down performance-wise, which is really galling. Um, because the moment you inline something recursive, that kernel of it just isn't going to get specialized. Um, so this is the problem that I'm kind of wrestling with right now. I don't have, I don't have answers here yet. I don't have perfect answers anyways. I have pieces of a story. And I want to try and build a lens story around it. Um, because we've all heard that like, the problem with monad transformers and monads in general is that monads don't compose, right? Like applicatives, you can take two applicatives, F and G, and composition of F and G is still applicative, and everything's happy. But monads don't have that nice property. Um, because if you have like M and N are both monads, you need to join M and N to get M of N of A. There's no way to get the M's and the N's next to each other without something that lets me move M over N, or some way to embed M into N, or something. Right? Um, and for each individual monad transformer, that something is very different. Right? So monad, monads don't compose, but monad transformers do. Right? You can always nest monad transformers inside of other monad transformers. The effects may not lift out. Right? Like if you use cunt, on something with a, that was a monad writer instance, the monad writer doesn't move out. And the reason is, is that the laws don't always compose, which is actually sort of a big, a big problem in the effect systems community, is that they, they say you can write handlers for things independently of all the other monads, which is great, right? The whole goal here is to say that these things compose, you don't have to write n squared instances. But we write n squared instances because there are n squared inter interactions and they don't all work. So there's something dangerous going on there <coughs> um, once you start allowing non-algebraic effects, like Kant and things like that. Um, so every effect system is going to run into problems, and there's a whole other rant I need to give on that somewhere. I will do something. Um, so where was I? Um, so we have this M of N of M of N of A, and we're trying to get M of N. M of N. Um, so monads don't compose, because we need some way of mashing these things together. But monad transformers already bake in how they are going to move over each other. So how does this work? Well, reader T 
EMA is what? Reader T, E goes down with A, right? What does this rely on? This relies on the distributive law that says that M of E arrow A can be turned into E to M of A. I can always pull this function out. I can put it in, I can put E into the environment and then F map with it, right? There's this distributive law. Writer T. Right? Um, what does this rely on? Well, this says that if I have M, um, E comma M of A, I can turn this to M of E comma A. That I can grab the E, put it in the environment, and then map it in to M. State uses kind of a mishmash of both. Um, what is this relying on? Well, this is saying that I can, um, <clears throat> if I have, um, I can push the function side out, I can pull the function side out and I can push the pair side in, right? We use both of the distributive laws that we got for reader and writer above. Um, and so each monad transformer does something very different to, um, <clears throat> commute the effect in order to make it so that we can work with that M of N of M of N of A to, tr to try and join. The join is really the hard part of making a monad um, out of two other monads. Um, so each of these uses some kind of distributive law or state really uses the fact that if you have an adjunction, you can sandwich a monad in the middle of the adjunction and the result is still a monad. Um, okay, um, so what I want to show is that while monads don't compose, monad transformers do. So I can look, I can build a category. We built the category of functors on Haskell, right? We could build a category of monad transformers on Haskell where every object in the category is a monad transformer. And where the arrows between them are what we'll call monad transformer homomorphisms. That's a, a mouthful. But now a, um, I'll just, For all M and A, such as M is a monad, uh, S, M, A becomes T, M. This is a, this says that I can turn one, I can take every operation that this monad transformer does and turn it into one the other one does. So what I want to do is I want to say that return before applying this thing should mean the same as return after applying this thing. Bind before applying this thing should mean the same thing as bind after applying it. Lift before applying it, lift after applying it, right? This is what I wanted. What I wanted to be a monad homomorphism is a natural transformation, plus the operate, plus the claims that return goes to return and bind goes to bind. Like it doesn't matter if I apply the transformation before I bind or after I bind. Uh, natural transformation is just a functor homomorphism. It doesn't matter if I half map before I apply the natural transformation or after I apply the natural transformation. Um, so here are my monad transformers. Um, I want these kind of, these are the arrows in my category. So in this category of monad transformers, is there a tensor I can equip to make this category monoidal? And the answer actually is yes. I can make this thing, which is nested. Just kind of like we did with um, composition. But in order for this to work, I need to know that given M is a monad, T of M is a monad, so that I can actually use S of TM of A as a monad. Right? I can't lift otherwise. So this is why I needed that little bit of monad M implies monad of T of M, that extra strength that monad trans didn't give me. Okay? 
And now, what is the identity here? Anybody want to guess what the unit would be for this? Hmm? Well, technically it has to be an identity transformer, right? So identity T. There you go. Right, so if M is a monad, identity T of M is a monad. There's a lift, it's a transformer, it's obvious if I can turn M of A into N of A, I can turn identity T, M, A into identity T, N, A. I have all the things. Um, if I smash this in the middle here, this doesn't change anything. And tensoring is associative. It's not commutative, sadly. Um, not for all monads, just for some. Uh, or not for all monad transformers, just for some. And we have a unit. So we have the skeleton upon which we can talk about um, monoid objects and stuff like that, right? We can play all sorts of games here. Um, and I don't actually need monoid objects here. I only really need this notion of, hey, a monad transformer lens from S day says that there exists some complement C and D such that S is isomorphic to um, tensor of C and tensor of my A. Now, I really should have like picked M or something here. <laughs> More monad indicative. But the idea here is that we can zoom in on part of a monad transformer stack. And my goal here is to then start allowing us to do interesting things in this zoomed in portion. I mean, so ultimately my goal um, doesn't really have anything to do with monad transformers. And this is where this story is going to start to break down a bit. Um, so let's actually look at some code that I've actually prepared that compiles beforehand, and we'll recognize large portions of it. Um, so what I'm going to say now is we want, given monad transfer T, a transformer will just be that equipped with a couple of extra things. The first thing is that we need that monad of M gives me monad T of M. And the second one is going to be um, a necessary component for tensor to actually be a bifunctor. And this is actually really annoying because it means that cont T is no longer a monad transformer. Because cont T can't implement hoist. So this is going to say this. If you give me a monad homomorphism between M and N, again, this says that return over here must be the same as return, uh, return over here, bind over here, and the same as bind over here. Um, then, or the, the binding before or after you apply this mapping. Shouldn't change the answer. Uh, then I will give you a monad homomorphism between T of M and T of M. The problem is, is Kant, uh, RMA is Kant T, if I can get this right. A goes to M of R, goes to M of R, right? Has both M occurring in positive and negative position. So it's here. So if you gave me a monad homomorphism from M to N, I could map this one forward from M to N. But if you gave me one from M to N, I couldn't do anything with it here because this is the argument to me. It's something I'm given. So it's the wrong polarity. So you actually need a monad isomorphism to map over the M under Kant. And most CPS monads have this problem. So there's, this is not a perfect story, right? We're starting to see where this starts to fall apart. The, the tensoring here is too much for any sort of CPS monad because these extra operations are not always going to be available. This one should, you know, if you have a real monad transformer, damn it, this one should be available. This hoist is a little more controversial because it means that Kant can't be an effect, that codensity and all sorts of other monads that we have that we use a lot of um, are not going to be able to be transformers. Um, so I don't know fully what that says about the nature of these effects. I know that they're non-algebraic effects and there's a bunch of other things that we can talk about there. But that doesn't um, reassure me. Right, if my goal here is to say, hey look, transformers are better than effect systems because we can handle all of these other effects. 
than coming over here and trying to say, well, here's a solution that now rules out the same class of effects as many effect systems, kind of shoots me in the foot, but it also says something about the nature of effect systems. Um, so I'm happy to have that as an open discussion, right, as a, as a thing to go forward. So now we have an identity T as a transform. Hey, look, transform is a really easy function to write. You know how we said subdict just kind of magically does all the work and we get GHC to prove it? We got GHC to prove that identity T will lift M into identity T of M as a function. Um, and then hoist here says if you give me a monad transformer, uh, you give me a monad homomorphism, I'll give you a monad homomorphism. So I just got to apply it underneath identity T. Um, writer T. I just apply it because this is quantified over all x, so x can be pairs just as easily as it can be single values. Um, reader t, we compose because we have to get past the function. Say t, we compose and use the fact that it could be pairs. Um, maybe t, these are all really boring instances. Um, right? This is not, nothing in here should be surprising at all. Now, but when we run into comp t, we are stuck because there's no way that we can write hoist. And with, without hoist, we're going to get stuck when we go to write tensor. Now that's a mouthful, but I wanted to make sure that the, the type got monomorphized correctly. Um, and now we're, now we're going to see where I have to start using that constraints library in earnest, right? Because in order to lift here, I need to convert, I need to prove that T of M is a monad so that S will let me lift T of M into S of T of M. Or T of M A. T M A into S of T M A. Right? So we use transform, which is the, comp, the, the proof that monad lifts over T. We open up that dictionary to now bring into scope a dictionary for um, Monad for T of M, because we know monad of M, because that's what, that was passed to lift. That's one of the arguments to lift. So we're given monad for M, we need to show monad for T of M, and then now we can lift, lift of M, to lift over the tensor transform. That. Guess what, it gets worse. <laughs> um, so in order to hoist, we have to Transform and transform and then hoist hoisting. Transform is easy all the time, but everything else is hard. Um, to F map, we need to transform to transform to prove that our S of T of M is a monad, and then we can F map with the fact that we brought that into scope. You know, we want to use this F map because it will be the better F map that we got from the functor instance that was on S of T of M. Ugh. So we have to do all of these pointwise. But once I've done that, then everything gets lifted to the sort of optimal operator. This is ridiculous. Um, sadly, I can't convince GHC to do these proofs for me on that. Um, so if we, to bind, we prove that S of T of M is a monad by composing transform with transform, and bind underneath the run tensors and so on. Um, fail still in monad. We haven't gotten rid of that yet. We've got a couple of years. Um, now things get messy, and this is really just because um, when we say that we're a monad transformer homomorphism, we don't say how we deal with like all of the monad writer, monad state, all of the other effects, like applicative. Or we applicative you know, subclass of monad, so we, we do or we do get uh, or a superclass of monad, so we do get how that gets mapped. But things like monad plus and stuff like that. So what we're doing here is I'm saying that if um, S of T of M is alternative, then the result is alternative. Stuff like that. It's, it's not, we don't lift the monad plus operations over our monad. We take whichever ones we were going to get from the composition anyway. So if I compose state T, if I tensor state T S with reader T R, then I should get a monad state my goal is to get a monad state for S for my tensored thing, and a monad reader for R for the tensored thing, right? And if I have a shadow reader inside, it should do what the MTL does all the time. So, like for t state, state is a purely algebraic effect, so it lifts really easily. We never have to call run tensor in any of these things, but since 
Uh, monad writer isn't on the brag. We have all these run tensors, so there's some partial handling going on there. So the effect system is really <coughs> sad about the fact that writer has these two operations. Um, monad reader has local, which you can see the run tensor in here indicates it's not algebraic and it's doing evil things. Catch error, also non algebraic, but it sneaks in a run tensor. Um, this monad IO I'm not really happy with. It's um, kind of wrong because it's not doing the pointwise lifting. It could be done the other way, like I did all the others where we say, hey, look, is there a monad IO for S of P of M? And show it. Um, now, we can build our notion of a monad transformer homomorphism. So this gets messy. Um, and if I try to just define it the easy way that I described earlier, where I just say that, hey, look, for all M such that, uh, for all M and A such that um, the endpoints are, are such that uh, M is a monad, I'll take S, M, A, T, M, A. Without packaging up the fact and the knowledge that S and T are transformers, this doesn't quite work. Um, you start running into problems as you build this concept up. Okay. Um, we're good. We're, to, we're about 50 minutes in. I've got time to go through pro functors and pro functor lenses and then try to beat this up. Okay. Um, let me. Uh, All right, so I built up lenses as isomorphisms earlier in that other little file that we were playing with, right? And this is one way to think about lenses. Another way to think about lenses, which is um, a little bit more peculiar, I guess, to me, um, is to think about them in terms of profunctors. How many people here have seen profunctors in Haskell yet? Okay, two, three, four, all right. Um, how many people have seen bifunctors in Haskell? How many people have seen bifunctors in category theory? All right. So, I'll just define a profunctor, and we'll see what the hell good they are. Profunctor P has some operation called die map. Let me get this right. Um, so um, it maps forward on the second argument, right? It's covariant in the second argument, it's contravariant in the first. So if you give me an arrow from A to B, I can map backwards along the first argument. So what is an example of one of these? Um, so what's dimap here? Dimap here says if you give me a function from A to B, and a function from C to D, and a function from B to C, I can give you a function from A to D. So how do I get there? Well, I take my A, I feed it from my A to B, I feed it from the B to the C, I feed it from C to D, and I get D. I have all the pieces, all the steps. So what do we have to do? We have to take, um, let's just write it out really longhand, right? We're going to call f of a, and then we're going to call h on that, and then we're going to call g on that, right? Of course, we can get rid of this. We can point free our stuff. And we get that. Blech. But it's there. Um, but this isn't the only profunctor we can have. Um, every arrow is a profunctor. As a matter of fact, profunctor really should be a superclass of arrow. Um, I'm not fighting that battle yet. Um, <laughs> we'll get a little bit broader adoption for profunctor first. Um, what's another good example of a profunctor? Um, how many people have seen like a Kleisley? in uh, control of monads. Okay. So there's a new type, Kleisley MAB, which is one of the standard arrows. I said all arrows are monad, uh, are, are of this sort. 
So, this right now uses monad m, but we can use functor m. Um, because functor is not a super classic monad, you're welcome. Uh, diamond app fg Cleisley h is going to be the Cleisley arrow that says um, that. And so what we do is we map over the m to apply our function from b to c, or whatever it was. My combinators are my the type variables which I've swapped all over the place here. Um, and there turns out to be a bunch of other interesting pro functors. Okay. So when I talk about lenses, one of the encodings of lenses that we use, the, the encoding of lenses that we use in the lens library is this, um, or not new type, ah, type lens, S-T-A-B, there's a little bit. Um, it's for all F, functor F, A goes to F of B, goes to S, goes to F of T. Right? And that works great because functors in Prelude, and so people can define lenses without ever importing my library. Um, which has been a wonderful thing for getting lenses adopted across the Haskell ecosystem because it breaks the dependency problem, right? Later libraries that people write have to depend on everything that came before them because no one is ever going to depend on something new, right? Um, whereas the lens story has says, well, you can supply lenses all you want, all you need is access to the prelude, and you can define a little type alias like this, never even export it from your program, and just bang out lenses all day long. Um, in order to see that this is equivalent to the lens thing that we threw away earlier, is a bit tricky. Um, where did I throw away the lens? So this is... Um, a little bit different, because we got this like SI and CAI thing. So we're going to think of S and T, and A and B is like, this is S at I, this is like S at J, this is A at I, this is A at J. And this is saying that I can take SI to CAI and CAJ to SJ. This is just two instantiations of a more general schema that the type system won't let us type So, S and T could possibly be given those horribly long names, where they're in subscript indicating that they're instances of a family, and this is how S and T relate, and there's a lot of posts I've written on this topic. But, um, why is this thing equivalent? Well, in order for, um, if we think about these as getter setter pairs, right, that, that a lens, Um, it has a get that says I know how to get an A out, and a set um, that says if you give me a B, I'll give you a T. Um, the, this definition and this definition are equivalent, and it's not obvious, but in order for this thing to exist at all, in order to build an F of T, since I don't know anything about F, the only way I can construct an F is by calling this function. Right? The only way I can call this function is if I have an A. So there has to be some way, and the only other thing I know is S. So in order to get an A, I have to have a function from S to A. Right? Otherwise I couldn't call this function at all. So, check. This has to be there. Second, now I have an F that's full of B's, but I want an F full of T's. S is in my environment, so I need to be able to say, given S in my environment, give me a way to turn B's into T's. Done. So there's a setter floating around somewhere. Okay, so the, the lens formulation, as heavily obfuscated as it is, is really this getter setter pair in disguise. That's one way to see it, right? Now, to prove that you can go the other way, you have to show that given appropriate choices of f, you can extract the get function and the set function. And that's, um, if you choose identity, um, then we can build, uh, what do we get? We get s goes to t, identity t. 
And so if you give me a function from A to B, and S goes to T. So if you just ignore A, and give me a B, right? So A goes to identity B, and just ignore this. So this is just B, S, T, once you remove the new type bias. That's this thing with some argument shuffled. And if you pick the constant functor, um, you can pick const R or const A. So A goes to const AD. This is just, you just call this with const. And this is going to give me S goes to const AT, which is just A. So this is S goes to A. So you just pass the thing const, and you'll get out A. So you can recover both together and center. And you can then show, oh, show that this is isomorphic, that you know, no information is gained or lost by going between the two representations. <sighs> um, when we start talking about isos in lens, things get really ugly. Um, an isomorphism in lens Such that if I pick P, which we already established that arrow can be a profunctor, right? So if I pick P as function arrow, then this devolves to a lens. Right? Um, and then I can always show that if P is a profunctor, then P of A, F of B is a profunctor. Because all I'm doing here is. Um, I'm covariant in this argument, so I can just I can die map with an F map in that particular position. I can I can always do this without hurting this being a profunctor. And I can always pick F as identity. So I haven't gained any power by putting the functor there either. So it's because this is for all P and F. So you could always pick F as identity. Um, and so this is really power-wise, this is equivalent to the much more succinct definition. If you give me a profunctor, I will take PAB and turn it into PST. OK? So an ISO is really just saying that S, is, S goes to A and B goes to T. This is this function here. Like, this is another way to think about it, right? We really want ISO. And then if you have the two parameter version of it, this would be <laughs> S goes to A and A goes to S. We can go back and forth, right? Um, but with the extra arguments, um, gosh. with the extra arguments, we can show that this representation and this representation are equivalent by die map and the laws that we have for die map that are like the functor laws. So if all I know about P is that it's a profunctor, if I have to get from this representation to this representation, I have to have some function that goes from S to A, and I have to have some function that goes from B to T. That's the only thing I can, because the only thing I know about P is that it's a profunctor. The only operation I can perform on it is die map. And die map said, you give me the operation that can map backwards on this argument, and the uh, argument that can map forward, I can map forward with on this argument. OK? So since all I knew was die map, this is equivalent to the obvious definition of an ISO. It's just not obvious. So why the hell am I doing this? Um, Okay, so once I've got this, it would be really nice if there was a formulation of lenses that didn't involve this F, that just used some constraint like we had with the profunctor version, because this would be much simpler. Here's 
here. Pro Funker P. Some constraint that's stronger than Pro Funker because this is a little bit more constrained. Um, and it turns out that there is such a constraint in my Pro Funker's library, and we call it strong. Um, so strong uh, requires me to give you these two definitions, that there's a first and a second, that you can take a pro functor that knows how to get, like, get a, like, that goes from A to B, and give you a pro functor that goes from A comma C to B comma C. Now, if we put on our lens goggles, like the lens vocabulary, and we, we, we switch back and forth, this would be the lens for underscore one, and this would be the lens for underscore two that's provided by the lens library today. If we switch to this vocabulary for lenses, if we switch to this pure pro functor vocabulary, where a lens just used um, uh, strong instead of the functor, and ISOs just use the pro functor rather than just a pro, a pro functor and a functor, then First prime and second prime would be underscore one and underscore two, the lenses that look at the first half of a pair or the second half of a pair. Those would be the operations that you'd supply for your profunder. And then this would work because all lens operations is like zooming into some part of a product, right? And so with first and second, you can zoom in on part of a product. And then you can use die map to shuffle things around that are isomorphic to this. And so by the time you're done, you've got the bits and pieces you want. Okay. Oh. Go back to this thing. So now we had uh, where were we? We had tensor, right? Which is S of T M of A. And what I'm interested in is encoding the lenses and things like that that I want to play with harmonic transformers in terms of a pro functor. But now we're working with monad homomorph or monad transformer homomorphisms instead of function arrows. <laughs> this is where it gets crazy. I apologize. Oh, okay, it got crazy about 45 minutes ago. Um, but. <laughs> So if you give me two monad transformer homomorphisms, I will give you a monad transformer. Uh, I will give, I will use them to map over your pro functor. Where it's a pro functor on the category of monad transformer homomorphisms. That. And then um, I really want this proof that I can extract the dictionary. That if I have a pro functor from T to U, that I can extract knowledge that the endpoints are transformers. This winds up becoming administratively important. Um, I found that out when working on my Hask library, which I've given separate talks on, so that's available online. And then we can talk about strength. And before we said there was a difference between a left lens and a right lens once we started dealing with categories where, where the tensor wasn't symmetric. So now we can talk about left strength and right strength, where it says that if we can say, I can take a pro functor that knows how to get from S to T, and I can use it on the outside of a tensor, or can I use it on the inside of a tensor? And the goal here was to maybe get to the point where we talk about Kant letting us do things that were left lenses. We could work on the outside of Kant, but not under Kant. Um, I don't have a full story there yet. And then we can say that strong is the combination of both of those constraints. Um, and if those of you who are familiar with the constraint kinds and the new um, uh, machinery or might be wondering why I don't say type strong P is T left strong P, T right strong P. And use type alias for this. This is actually strictly weaker than this because you can't talk about strong without having it applied to an argument if you use the type alias. Whereas you can talk about strong naked here. It's just a minor quirk of the fact that type aliases are actually somewhat less powerful than the class instance trick that people have used for, because you can't talk about strong without it being applied to an argument, if you were to use this type. Um, 
And so now, ISOs for transformers here would say, for any profunctor on the category of monad transformers um, that goes from A to B, I can give you one from S to T. Lenses would say, for any strong profunctor on that category. And then we can show later on that um, HOM itself is a profunctor, just like function arrow was a profunctor before. And then I'm leaving these two as an exercise for the room. Um, maybe not for now, but to take home. <laughs> to show that um, HOM is both, indeed, both left strong and right strong. And with that, I can play some interesting games. Um, so now we can start talking about ISOs. And this is an incredibly verbose format. I apologize for shanking the screen right after I set it to a nice readable scale. All right. Whee! Uh, so, this is a monad transformer ISO that proves that reader commutes over reader. Sorry, could you put it down? Yes, let me lift this up on the screen. There. Okay. This is. Don't read the rest. Um, <laughs> so what does this say? It says that if I tensor a reader that knows how to get an A, like a reader with an environment A and a reader with an environment B, let's just ignore the the right hand column. This is the S T A B. This is like this is the same thing, but with different type variables chosen, just so that we can essentially the scheme more than um, This is isomorphic to reader T B tensored with reader T A. So if I were to flip the order of these things, this is isomorphic. So we die map with this little swap thing, which says just arbitrarily we can swap. So we just swap and swap. And it's go grab the A and the B, and then pass them in in as B and then A. Ooh, not for shaking. Um, here I went and built a. Um, a monad <laughs> transformer isomorphism between the nesting of reader and reader, right? We read reader T A and B, and reader T of a pair of A and B. Um, and this just required us to have sort of tuple and untuple. Now we can start building lens like combinators. Um, this would be sort of the equivalent of uh, set or something like that. Um, which says that if you have a um, lens, basically, that knows how to get a U out of S, say, uh, or uh, knows how to map S to UV. So it says that if you give me a monad transfer homomorphism between U and V, I will give you a monad transfer homomorphism between S and T. Then I can, I can take your monad transform homomorphism between U and V and give you a monad transform homomorphism between S and D. This is it. Um, but if we unpack that um, by like stripping off the HOM new type, then you get this sort of um, you give me the monad transform homomorphism, I'll give you a monad transform homomorphism. Um, and now we're going to start running into the things I don't like about this. Um, so I, I spent all this time building up all of this machinery just to tell you that it sucks. Um, and it's mostly because I just wanted to have other people who actually have this vocabulary in their head thinking about the problem. Um, both people in the room and whoever is unfortunate enough to try and stumble through watching this video before they realize at the end, the punchline is I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so earlier on when we were talking about composition as our tensor, functor composition as our tensor, one of the examples was that I can take state and I can run reader, I can embed reader effects in it or something like that. I can turn reader, into, I, can, I can show that reader, I can lens into the reader part of state. And that one happens to be nicely, fully faithful, and there's a wonderful embedding there that shows that, um, that this happens to be a monad transformer homomorphism, or a monad homomorphism. Um, but it didn't have to be, it just, we got lucky. Um, but the machinery I just built isn't sufficient for me to write this. I really want to be able to say, here's a transformer lens that says that I can, get a, I can run a reader TS effect inside of state TS. And I can't directly build this out of the machinery I've built. 
Because what I need to do in order to build this thing is I would need to show that state is actually isomorphic to a composition of monad transformers where reader is one of those transformers. Right? And that doesn't work because reader isn't one of the transformers in a stack that makes up state. It's, it's part of the functor composition stack, but it's not a trans, it, like we don't use, we don't bind them together in a way that's consistent with reader. And I thought for a little while that I could get away with using um, an update monad, which is actually something that is um, uh, closer to the composition of reader and writer than state is. So state looks kind of like reader and writer because it's got a pair in it and it's got a function in it. But the pair isn't used like writer. It's not a mon there's no monoid involved. Um, there's this thing called an update monad, and I guess I have time to kind of describe it. Um, all right, this, this one's fine. Um, so what, what happens when state's giving you too much power and you want to you know, give a little bit back? Um, how many people have seen like a list of successes monad uh, for a uh, monad-based parser? Have you seen, have anyone seen a list of successes parser? So Wadler, I think back in 85 or so, wrote a little parser that looked like this. Right? So today we would know this as state t of um, string list or something like that, right? You could, you, could, you could get away with just writing this as a state t operation. Or, um, transfer. List is the base monad. So there's parser. Um, in the Wandler list of successes. It was how to replace failure with a list of successes with the original paper. Um, and so how, when you're, when you're, it's basically saying, given this input, here's the list of successful parses. Um, I parsed an A out of it, and here's the remaining string. Um, the, 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 a couple of complaints that you might have about this data type, which is that it's too big in some sense. This output string, I, don't, I can't tell you how many characters in I am, so I have to add some bookkeeping to manage that. I can't tell you that this string is necessarily a suffix of the original string. I can't tell you that I didn't actually start shoving text back in that I wasn't given. Um, so is there a monad that's a little bit smaller that you could um, do the same thing with? Talk about uh, Tarmo Ostalo um, and a couple other folks worked out this, uh, this notion of an update monad. Um, which is sort of interesting. We can say that update, S, M, A, I'm gonna just use two terms here. Um, update, S goes to A and M. So M is going to be a monoid. Let's do M and A. Let's make this even more like, eh, no, I was gonna, say, I was gonna show it as um, closer to the reader thing. Um, that acts, on S. How many people here know what a monoid action is? Or an action of a group on a set or something like that? All right, a couple of people. So we're going to make a monoid action class, which is going to require M to be a monoid, which we're just say act says that if you give me M, I'll give you a monoid action, I guess. Um, a, a function from S to S. And what I want is that act of memphi is id, and I want that act of m dot act of n is act of append n. These are the two laws I want to have hold. So no matter what I give you, if you can uh, tell me s and m such that those properties hold, I'll call that a monoid action on that set. And every monoid can be thought to trivially act on itself. Like you've got as its own carrier set as a like there's different ways to do it. On groups you usually do uh, conjugation and fancy things, but with monoids you don't have inverses, so you, have, you can only really do the boring things. Um, 
which is that I could say, well, my pen is a, mod, is a perfectly valid definition of act if S was M. And act my pen is it would be one of the laws, so we're good there. And act of the composition here is going to be an associativity law in disguise. And so by the time we're done, this is boring. Um, but we could build something more interesting here. If I kind of come up here and replace that, I'm going to say int. Really should be like natural number, right? We're going to get non-negative ints, right? We're going to be the actual thing that we want to do here. I'm using int because drop takes an int. The monoid action I want to use here is going to be drop. The monoid will be addition. And what this will do is this will say, um, given the input string, I've produced an A and I consume this many characters. And then to bind off of that, what do you do? You drop that many characters and then you pass that in as the input state for the next thing. And you carry forward. Now you don't have to worry about people injecting new text. You have to worry about them injecting negative numbers. They use ints, not nats, but whatever. Um, but now we've got this monoid that nicely acts on our string. Okay? So we could come up to state, and we might try and play games saying that state is actually um, an update monad in disguise. If we pick the last monoid, which is like, um, it's a new type around maybe, such that if you append, if the second one, if, uh, it takes the last just, basically, and says that's the value, Otherwise, it leaves it to nothing if, not, if either one of them is there. That's our append. So it would be like the latest state update. And then we could say that um, state would be um, equivalent to a um, an update monad with last as the monoid, last of my state as the monoid, and the action being like from maybe. Being saying like if, if I have a and I have an A and I you didn't give me an update, it's the or if you give me an input state and you didn't update the state, then it's this state. Otherwise, if you gave me a new state, it's this new state. It hurts my head a little bit, but by the time you're done, you can actually say that state is really an update monad. And then you can sort of argue that state is the composition of reader and monoid, but it's got this funny interaction. And then I get lost. So I was hoping that I could try and decompose state that way in order to build the um, local state, which is one of the motivating examples that I had, which was that there is um, there is definitely a monad homomorphism from reader TS to state TS, right? That I can embed, I can I can run any reader action in a state monad just by running it and then forgetting, it, it can't change the state, what do you do? Um, you just take the state, plummet out the output, and you're done. There's a monad homomorphism that goes the other way. There's one that says, I can take any state action and run it as a reader action. I can just forget the output state. Um, so there's monad homomorphisms in both directions. They're, they don't give you a monad isomorphism. Um, there's sort of a section or track situation. But it's not good enough for this. The thing that I built here isn't good enough for the kind of effects that I want to talk about. And this whole system isn't really good enough for the goal that I originally had, which was what I want to do is I want to write to a concrete monad transformer stack. I want to write to state T of reader T of this, of IO, like something concrete. And then what I want to be able to do is give me the lens that tells me how to embed this effect in my larger monad. Or give me it be a setter, like the, the particular vocabulary I'm not concerned about. What I'm looking for is a thing that describes how to swizzle the operations for this smaller concrete thing that GHC can optimize, right? Because it was written for a concrete monad transformer stack, so GHC knows exactly what dictionaries it's using. It can go pull all of them in. It can inline all the code. It can do all the case of case stuff and transform it into nice, tight, dense code that's not constantly going mother may I and looking up in a dictionary how to do the next thing. And then what I can do is I use the, the lens or the optic here at the outsides of this to say, hey, let me swizzle the thing into the format of this nice dense block of code. Let me do the worker wrapper kind of transformation here into the format this thing wants, 
go, and then take the result that came out of this nice, tight, recursive core. Because what we're doing with the monad transformers now is we're saying, hey, look, you should write to this general API. Let's keep picking up, picking up constraints. We're working with a monad that has all of this stuff built in. And every time I bind, I have to deal with every layer of the monad transformer stack. So in, even before I add the mother may I stuff, it's still expensive. So I'm trying to find a way to get there. And yeah, that's not working. Um, so the question here I'm playing with is, have I gone too far? Am I, am I, there, yes, there's a category of monad transformers here, right? Yes, it's monoidal. Um, do I care? Do I really just want the monad homomorphisms and a way to compose monad homomorphisms in a nice way so that I can talk about how to, maybe that's just the Switzerland that I really need and I don't really need this ability to swap out effects in a more principled way. Um, and I'm open to discussion here. Like The problem that I have is that, again, monads don't compose. So there's no tensor directly on monads, right? So when I go back to the lens formulation, so now, I can, now that we've got enough stuff that I can really articulate the problem. Um, if I go back to this notion of a lens in this um, original file that we're playing around with, and I started saying, hey, look, a lens is really that I can break things apart into the product of CNA or composition or the tensor, right? There's no tensor I can give you on two monads. Um, not properly. I can, um, I can play some games with um, building monad products and co-products, but the, like, the product of two monads exists and the co-product of two monads doesn't necessarily exist. There's some lavier theory-ish kind of stuff that you can do to say, well, give me two handlers that know how to embed this into a final thing. You can, you can pick a particular final encoding of this that is sort of correct, but I don't know how to work with that. Um, what I want is, I want a way to pick out the subset of effects that I want to handle Define those swizzling kind of wiring, uh, wirings in the back. But if I if I do this in the lens setting, I can't say that it's a lens because I don't have a tensor between two lenses that I could use. I can't say here's the state T effect and the and the writer T effect and the reader T effect. Now here's where the effects state people get to be really happy. I can talk about this system in a system of algebraic effects. If I have like a uh, you know, like it's basically a free monad of a list of possible things of different requests and responses that I can handle. Then I can I can I can play with that list. It's associative. I can or it's it's commutative. I can shuffle things around. I can tuple it up. I can say these are the effects I want to deal with, and here's the smaller monad I want to directly embed into this larger context. How do I swizzle the elements out of this smaller list into this larger list that happens to contain everything in the smaller list? That kind of stuff is really easy to do. So there's an effect system story that's in some ways better than the transformer story that I was looking for. It's really complicated. Um, oh, it's really complicated. So I don't know. <laughs> um, so that is the problem statement that I have right now <laughs> that I am looking for a solution to. Um, and I think that's everything I really wanted to say on the topic. So at this point in time, I'm happy to kind of open things up and talk to people. And, and if anybody has any ideas or what have you. Um, I mean, but if anyone has any questions right now, they can ask them. Or, if or we can just wander down to the pub or what have you, yeah. Any questions? I mean, any question you ask now will be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. So it's, it's a matter of whether you want it on the record and captured for posterity or just ambush me on the ground.